Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Joe Flasher. I'm the Open Geospatial Data Lead for Amazon Web Services. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the stuff that we are doing, but then mostly about what our customers are doing related to disaster response. Uh, so first, I'd actually like to start uh, and propose a name change, because I realized uh, some of what I'm going to be talking about is related to software. Uh, but it's not just software. It's also going to be open data, right? So. Uh, I thought we should call it like free and open source software and data for geospatial. That sounds terrible. So then I thought, I, this is a really great idea. It was after like the other night. So <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I thought that we could just add another letter. Uh, so maybe like free and reusable open source software and data for geospatial. Uh, I really like this because then we get to have a cool mascot. Right? Uh, apologies, I had to find something that's labeled for commercial reuse, as we're a commercial entity, so that's why you got this. And I would just like to propose that we do this in time for Calgary, because uh, it seems like it would be appropriate. So anyways, uh, I don't know how to actually make this petition, but I'm all into Frosty 4G. OK. So um, like I said, I work for Amazon Web Services. Uh, I work in the open data team. Uh, part of my job is to oversee uh, our public data set program, in particular, the geospatial data sets. Um, if you've seen me talk before, uh, you've almost definitely seen me talk about this. We work with a lot of awesome customers to make data available in the cloud. And we try to do this in smart ways that make it easy to analyze uh, in the cloud. So uh, this is as opposed to a lot of traditional ways of making data available, which requires you to download massive amounts of data to your own computer, uh, store it yourself, and work with some uh, not necessarily friendly formats. Uh, we try to change that, and we work with a lot of our customers to do this. Specifically for geospatial, for the last couple years now, we've had something called Earth on AWS, which is basically a home for geospatial related things on AWS. Uh, so if you go to this page, you will see a link out to a whole bunch of data sets that we have available that you can use uh, and access, as well as uh, stories from our customers talking about how they're um, you do, uh, performing their geospatial workloads in the cloud. Um, because uh, it's my firm belief that it's not just enough to make data available. You need to help people figure out how to use that data, right? Or else it's just kind of pointless. So um, if you've seen me talk before, or hopefully you know that we make a lot of this data available. Uh, if you don't, please go there, check it out. But what you might not know is that uh, AWS also works with a lot of our customers uh, around disaster response related activities. So we do this in a couple different ways. Um, we actually do deploy into disaster response scenarios. Uh, we will send people out into the field. Uh, I myself have deployed in this capacity. Uh, I was down in North Carolina after uh, Hurricane Michael um, in the US. Uh, and we work with partners on the ground like ITDRC to actually rebuild connectivity in communities. We also work with groups like Humanitarian Open Street Map Team to uh, use our rather large uh, employee base to do mapathons and help uh, map uh, areas around uh, sort of the hot tasks, right? Just like uh, hopefully you all do. Uh, and then we also work with a lot of groups to try to incentivize and support the building of applications for good. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that more in a moment, because that's really leveraging uh, our customers in that capacity. So I sort of wanted to combine these two things, uh, the sort of open data, public data set piece that I see on a regular basis, as well as the disaster response uh, piece that we spun up around two years ago. Um, and so I wanted a little sort of uh, guiding sentence for what I just sort of wanted to think about. Um, and, and so it was to provide meaningful, actionable information as quickly as possible to respond to disaster situations. And, and again, AWS, uh, we're, we're a cloud provider, we're an infrastructure company. So I'm trying to think of how can we leverage our infrastructure knowledge uh, and what our customers are doing to sort of help in these sorts of scenarios. So the first thing we can bring to bear uh, is the publicly available data that we make available on AWS. Um, I had a link for this earlier, but if you didn't see it, the best place that you can find all this publicly available data is the registry of open data at AWS. It's just registry.opendata.aws. Um, and here I have the link that if you just want to see data sets that are tagged for disaster response, um, you can do so. So these are data sets. Um, a lot of it's the satellite imagery that folks have been talking about, like Landsat, Sentinel-2 data. But also there's like elevation data. So if you're trying to figure out which way water is going to flow uh, or like people often walk downhill, 
level, right? Um, so if you want to figure out which way somebody's going to walk, uh, if they're like lost at, uh, out in the woods somewhere, like you can use this to figure out which way they're going to go. Um, we also have, uh, there's a really cool group um, called Grio. Uh, they have the uh, open earthquake early warning network, I think, but it's uh, seismic sensors, real time seismic sensors uh, that are putting data out through AWS uh, in Chile and Mexico, I believe. Um, so there's a whole bunch of uh, varied variety of data sets there to look at. Um, and just sort of, uh, I just can't not include this slide because I think it's so awesome. Uh, when you think about access to data for disaster response, one of the main things that you need to think about is latency, right? If you're getting access to imagery, but it's hours and hours delayed, that's less helpful to you. So uh, we heard from a lot of our customers who own satellites that they weren't happy with the latency that they were seeing um, and, and how long it was taking them to get information to their customers. And so we said, okay, we will build a ground station network for you. So last year we launched AWS Ground Station to help customers who have satellites get their data into the cloud much more quickly. So Maxar is a launch company for this. Uh, Digital Globe, you might know them as previously. Um, so it took them previously it took them about an hour to get the data uh, from their satellite capture into the cloud, uh, which is where they're doing all their processing and uh, distribution of their data. And when they started using Ground Station in their tests, that went down to a minute. That's huge in a disaster response scenario, right? Like you can get data to people on the ground much more quickly. So I, I just love including the slide. So. Um, so, okay, we've got a lot of data, but that's not it, right? You need to be able to index it and find it. And so I'm not going to belabor this point too much because hopefully you've already seen a bunch of the stack talks. Um, but we're trying to do a better job of making the data that we make available have associated stack metadata alongside it, right? So if you do that then, you can then build um, indexes on top of it. And so this is work that Element 84 has done. So uh, Matt Hansen's here from Element 84. But this is built on top of SAT API. It's run by Element 84. And so it is an API that you can query all the, the geospatial data sets that are made publicly available in AWS that have associated stack metadata. So this isn't everything, because we haven't gotten stack metadata in for everything yet. But as we add more stack metadata uh, to those public data sets, you'll see them show up here. So if you're building any applications or just want to try this out for yourself, uh, you can go here. Like I said, this is all managed by Element 84. Um, and it will be a good representation of all the geospatial data that's on AWS. So we've got data. We have some sort of system that you, you can use to see what data is there. So what are people building with this? Or what can you do with data that's made available in the cloud smartly? So there's a whole bunch of interfaces that you can build on top of this, right? And so I'm just going to go through some of these quickly. Uh, this is work that was done by Vincent years ago. He won't give me something new to put in here. Uh, I did ask him the other day, but he said to still use this. So um, this is a slippy map like all of you have seen. And this isn't new anymore. Uh, but what this is doing is actually using serverless technologies to uh, do map tiling, right? So the reason why this is important is twofold. Uh, there's no underlying server running here. Right? And so Vincent's here in the audience. right? So uh, like Vincent doesn't have to pay to have a server running continuously. So if nobody's making any requests uh, to this mapping interface, uh, Vincent doesn't have to pay to keep a server running if nobody's using it. Right? The other piece that's important in the disaster response context is that disaster response workloads are very spiky. Right? Like you have nothing going on, and then all of a sudden a flood comes in, and you have a lot of people that are very interested in what you have. The serverless technologies are designed to scale up. So you have zero costs when nobody's using it, and they immediately scale up as they get used, right? which is a very cool property that you would like to see in disaster response scenarios. So this is something similar. This is work done by Synergize, um, powered by Sentinel Hub. Um, and so um, just the same sort of thing. It's using serverless in the back end, but this is showing it in an analytical context uh, instead of a visualization context. But it's the same idea. There's a trigger being made. Uh, function is spinning up very quickly, grabs the data it needs, and return it in some context. This is just showing it for uh, analysis rather than visualization. Uh, this is work that was done by uh, David Bittner um, before Foster GNA this year. Um, and he actually put map server inside a Lambda function. So that's the serverless technology I was talking about. Uh, so again, you don't need something running continuously. If nobody's using it, it'll spin up on demand. Pangeo has been talked about a little bit. I think Julia might have mentioned it the other day in one of the keynotes. Um, Pangeo is an open source community building um, large scale distributed analysis tools. But the ability of Pangeo to work efficiently is predicated on the fact that it has access to optimized data uh, sitting in an efficient storage mechanism. 
Uh, this is work that Hobu did. I think Connor is out here somewhere. Um, I have not met him before, so he might actually be sitting here. I don't know what he looks like. Uh, but this is work that was done on top of the USGS LiDAR data. I don't know if you can read the point in the top there, but that is 11 billion uh, points that were analyzed uh, and put together. Um, this is a whole bunch of LiDAR point cloud data over the US. The cool thing about this is Hobu did this for uh, USGS. Um, USGS themselves, so this is our US geological survey, um, USGS themselves said that they had never been able to see all their data in a cohesive manner until this work was done, right? And so this is putting LiDAR into a cloud optimized format, um, which is pretty cool since our government paid for it all. So it was nice for them to be able to see it. So a couple other projects just to call out. Um, this is Development Seed. They did uh, hurricane intensity predictions. Uh, this is on top of um, our US Meteorological Agency data. This is GOES data. These are geostationary satellites. Uh, this data is available on AWS. Um, but then what they did was do a deep learning model uh, that would basically uh, automate um, hurricane intensity predictions because they can look at, uh, there's a technique where you can look at clouds, um, like the shape of clouds, and you can figure out the hurricane intensity. Um, and this is work that was actually, I think, done by hand previously, but it would take on the order of six hours. Um, and they were able to automate this uh, and get it down to about 15 minutes, uh, which is, you know, that seems pretty awesome. Uh, Blue Dot Observatory. Uh, Andre, I think, maybe gave a workshop earlier on in the week. Uh, but this is work that was done by Synergize. So they were using Sentinel-2 data. They were analyzing water bodies around the globe. Um, this is actually in Cape Town uh, when one of their uh, major uh, water bodies was running out of water uh, when they had a water crisis uh, previously. And so the cool thing here is, um, again, all this data is made available in the cloud. Uh, this is ESA Sentinel-2 data. Um, but they are able to analyze this at scale, uh, but they are able to do this for a few dollars a month, which is fantastic, right? They analyze uh, water bodies from around the globe, uh, but, and they can do so for a few dollars a month, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I believe uh, Anjay is not here in the crowd, I don't think, but I believe uh, this code's all open source. The, it's, so it's the Blue Dot Water Observatory. And so all of these can be triggers. If you're trying to like set up a disaster, pipe, a disaster response pipeline, right? Like these could all be triggers. So if you start to notice uh, water bodies deteriorating, like that's potentially an indication of drought conditions, things like that. So you can use these as triggers. This is another project. The data is available uh, on AWS. This is OpenAQ. It's all it's, uh, open source community and open source project. And so this is an aggregation of uh, air quality measurements from around the world. I think it's something like 75 countries, 120 different sources. Um, if I was more on top of my game, I would have taken a picture of like an actual forest fire happening somewhere, uh, but I just took this the other day. And so you can see that one red dot. That one red dot is high PM10 uh, particulate matter in the air. Um, so this is uh, potentially a trigger of like a fire going on in the area, right? Or you could use this after the fact and see what the exposure is. Um, so when you do look at this over like a populated area like California when there's wildfires, uh, you will see a lot of dots glow, glow, uh, light up red. Those are all sensors on the ground. We also make OSM data available, so you can easily query that, right? If you're looking, so you can write something like a SQL query. This is work done by Seth Fitzsimmons. Um, you can make a, a simple SQL-like query. And again, uh, you don't need to run any servers to, to do any of this. So I sort of showed you a bunch of these examples, but we wanted to know what people who were deploying uh, actually wanted. So we worked with Element 84 to do a user need studies, and we talked to groups like American Red Cross, uh, Humanitarian Open Street Map, Doctors Without Borders, as well as tool developers like Open Drone Map, Mapillary, to see like what we could sort of try to put together uh, for people on the ground. Um, so I would recommend you go there to that site on the bottom right there, and you can see what sort of came out of all that. But um, for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to focus on the one piece, which is people wanted access to data in the field. Uh, and like being able to take compute into the field with them uh, would likely be very helpful. And so. Um, the main tool that we have to offer there is something called the Snowball Edge. Uh, this is a physically hardened device that you can actually pick up and take with you. So a lot of people think of the cloud as just something that exists. Uh, like I, I think it was Yvonne the other day who said it's other people's computers, which is true. But those computers don't need to be sitting somewhere far away. You can actually take one with you. So the Snowball Edge actually gives you access to the same cloud services, some subset of the same cloud services, and you can actually physically take that with you. Like you can see there's an airline shipping label on there, right? Like you can, you can 
check it uh, on an airline, and it gives you access to cloud services. So um, this was actually made as an import-export device. A cool little example of this is uh, USGS recently, when there were volcanoes in Hawaii, uh, the, they were worried that their data center was going to get overtaken by the volcano, so they were going to lose all their data. So we actually shipped one of the, well, we shipped a snowball to them, right? This is a physical device, so we shipped it to them. They stuck all their data on it, and it's got a little Kindle, so you just flip the, you flip the, the front of it, and it changes the shipping label. It gets sent back to us, and all of their data was now out of their physical like data center that was located in the lava flow path, and it got moved into the cloud. Uh, and I also wanted to include a fun GIF. So, so okay, I've got five minutes left, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I apologize, but disaster response data pipeline. What would this look like, right? So you can think of event triggers, right? So we all already saw some of these. If you're getting earthquake notifications, wildfires, you see smoke, you see sort of uh, water disappearing from water bodies, you can trigger on that. So you can start gathering up tools, right? So you pull open street map data like we saw, you gather Sentinel-2, Landsat data. If you have commercial data available, you can gather that as well. Um, there are a number of open source packages to allow you to do this. Then you can start provisioning servers, right? So you can use things like serverless, or you can actually provision um, like always on servers for the period of time that you need it. Um, you can start putting together static content websites that you know people are going to start accessing, and you can start caching them ahead of time, since you know you're going to get a lot of demand. And then you can start putting this data onto the physical device. And you can ship that device into the field, so you can walk into the field with something that you have locally that requires no external connectivity, and it will give you all your base map, it will give you all your pre-disaster imagery. And then you can start doing things in the field. Uh, you can start collecting drone imagery that can go right onto the device. You can start using things like field papers. Uh, any way that you can sort of collect data locally, you can put that back onto the device. And that device gives you compute on the edge, storage, um, and it'll give you a, it'll run a network. You can also just stick a network in front of it. And so any of your mobile devices or computers can access that. So a couple of examples of this. This is work we did with Seth uh, about two years ago, Seth Fitzsimmons. So this is open aerial map running on the snowball edge for local data visual. This is an example of using QGIS on a laptop using the device as an image server. You can also use something like Open Map Kit uh, and POSM running on the device. So this is all things that we've already prototyped running on the device. Um, LM84 has uh, some interfaces that they're using to try and bring all these pieces together. And if you're collecting data locally, um, we also work with groups to sort of figure out how best to um, push the boundaries of AI and ML on top of geospatial data. So if you're doing something like drone collects or if you're getting high resolution imagery after the event, what can you do sort of locally or in the cloud um, to like best analyze the, the data, right? And so um, if you saw Ryan talk the other day or Jake and Nick are here as well, um, this is a work that we're doing through SpaceNet. And so um, we're working with SpaceNet to push the boundaries of AI and ML on top of geospatial data um, and sort of try to help the community get there as well. And so there's uh, high-resolution res high imagery as well as uh, labels for a bunch of different cities around the world. So there's two challenges I just want to call out real quick, um, SpaceNet 4 and SpaceNet 5, because I think they're both very important for the disaster response context. Um, SpaceNet 4 took off Nader imagery, so the question was how off Nader can you get and have your models still perform? The reason why that's important in a disaster response context, if you want the quickest imagery, you're not necessarily going to have a satellite directly overhead. So you want to know how far off Nader will your model still work, and so how quickly can you get those sort of first look images and have your model still work. SpaceNet 5 is cool because in addition to doing road extraction and building actual routable road networks, um, it's looking at travel times. This is extremely important because if you have like a bridge that no longer exists and you need to re-update your routing locally, you want to know how fast you're going to be able to get any sort of response vehicles around to any given place, right? So being able to do this on the fly with updated imagery that's coming in post-disaster is, is pretty cool. So SpaceNet 5 is just starting here in the very new future, so if this is interesting to you, please check it out. Um, and just remember this is all part of this sort of... Um, what would it look like to have a disaster response pipeline uh, that you could spin up uh, at any point, right? So you've got your trigger, you gather your data, you build the interfaces, you deploy it to a physical device, and then you ship it out into the field with someone. 
So um, with that, I'm going to stop, but I just want to say if any of this seems interesting to you, any of the work that any of those folks are doing, um, please let me know. Uh, we have a credits program. If anyone's looking to prototype any workflows on top of geospatial data uh, in the cloud, uh, please just let me know or go to the website. Um, we are always looking to sort of support those efforts. Uh, and with that, I will stop. Thank you.